Hi everyone. This is the part 2 of Agnes Grey story. If you haven't watched the part 1 go watch it. Link is in the description. Chapter 14 A Visit to Ashby Park There was no doubt that Ashby Park was a wonderful place to live. The house itself was impressive and elegant and the large park was beautiful. There was a big lake, ancient woods, and herds of deer. I could see why Rosalie had been so keen to become the lady of an estate like this one. She seemed pleased to see me and although I was just a poor governess and a schoolteacher, she welcomed me warmly to her home. However, I did not like her efforts to make me feel comfortable. She told me that I should not be embarrassed about how I looked. She also said I should not worry if I felt that the beauty of the place was too much for me. I did not feel at all embarrassed about how I looked. And nothing that I saw around me in Ashby Park shocked me half as much as the changes I saw in Rosalie herself. During the twelve months since I had last seen her she had changed in a way you might expect to see after twelve years, not months. She was much thinner, looked very tired and seemed sad. Her new baby girl, who Sir Thomas felt should have been a boy, was just seven or eight weeks of age. I was surprised to see that Rosalie did not seem to be interested in the baby. She was happy to let the maid take care of everything that the baby needed. My bedroom was small but pleasant. Rosalie also showed me a small sitting room where I could spend time alone and read if I wanted to. I was taken on a tour of the house and was shown the fine Italian paintings and the fat French dog that was lying on an expensive looking cushion. Rosalie seemed very pleased with all these things. However, when we had finished the tour she took me into the main sitting room and then sat down in a chair. We sat in silence for a moment. Despite all of these impressive things that she had wanted so much, Rosalie did not seem happy. I asked her some questions, deciding to save my most important question until last. I started by asking her how her parents were. She told me that they were well enough. And how is Matilda? I asked her. Oh, she is very well, Rosalie replied, she is still wild and a little silly, but she has now got a new, fashionable governess. At last her manners are improving and mother will soon hold a ball at Horton Lodge so that she can be introduced to society. And how are the other people in the village? I ask Dot Emma Hatfield, for example. Ah, Mr. Hatfield. She said with a smile Dot I heard that he proposed to an old spinster and married her not long ago. He must have decided that he had not been lucky when he chose someone young and beautiful, so now he has chosen someone old and rich. And the Meltham family. I continued, ignoring her comment about Mr. Hatfield. Oh, I don't know much about them. I suppose they are all right, she told me. Well, I think I have asked about everybody. Oh, but not Mr. Weston, I said, what is he doing? I don't know. He's not in Horton anymore, Rosalie told me. How long ago did he leave? And where has he gone? I asked, trying not to sound too interested to hear her reply. I don't know anything about him, she said, looking out of the window, only that he left about a month ago. 
I didn't ask where he had gone. It seems that all the people in the village were very upset when he left because they liked him so much. Mr. Hatfield did not like them all making a fuss about him leaving, of course. He did not like Mr. Weston because he was so popular and he did not do things the way he was told to. Then Rosalie stood up. Anyway, I really must go and rest for a while before dinner. I will have to eat with Sir Thomas and his mother, old Lady Ashby, in the formal dining room. It's so dull. But I'll ask the maid to bring your dinner to you in the sitting room, if that is all right. I told her it was. She had invited me to her home, as her friend but we both knew that the social rules meant that it would not be correct for a poor schoolteacher to eat dinner with people as important as Sir Thomas and Lady Ashby. I walked back to the little sitting room where I could relax and look out onto the gardens. I ate my dinner there and then sat for a while thinking about Lady Ashby's present life and her past life, and about the little information she had given me about Mr. Weston. I was not rich enough to own a watch, so I did not know what time it was or how long I had been sitting and thinking. The sun began to disappear behind the trees of the estate. As it began to get dark, I felt lonely. I was tired and wished that I could go home. I was thinking about going back to my room when Rosalie appeared. She apologized several times for having left me alone for so long. She blamed her horrible old mother-in-law who she said had made her stay longer in the dining room. But I don't know why I had to stay there so long, she added, Sir Thomas never really listens to me. When he is in a bad mood all he does is complain and when he is in a good mood all he does is talk nonsense. And then, in either situation, he always drinks too much and falls asleep on the sofa. Could you not ask him to drink less and keep him busy with something else? I suggested, after all, you are very persuasive and are very good at keeping a man entertained. You think I am here to entertain him? She cried dot that's not my idea of a wife. It is the husband's job to keep his wife happy, it's not her responsibility to please him. And no, I will not persuade him to change his habits. I have enough work just putting up with him as he is without making even more of an effort in order to change him. She paused to take a breath, but I am so sorry that I left you alone for so long. What have you been doing? Well, mainly sitting here looking at the park, I admitted. Goodness! How boring that must have been! She told me, well, let's go to bed now, but tomorrow I will show you around the park. The next morning after breakfast Rosalie took me to see the gardens as she had promised. We walked through the park talking about what Rosalie had seen and done on her honeymoon. While we were walking, a gentleman on a horse rode towards us. As he passed us, he looked straight at me, so I could clearly see what he looked like. He was tall and very thin with a pale face that was a little grey. He had dull, cold eyes. He made no attempt to say hello to us. I hate that man, Lady Ashby said quietly as soon as he had ridden away. Who is he? I asked her. Sir Thomas Ashby, she replied coldly, my husband. I was shocked, but I asked her, do you really hate him? Yes, I do. Miss Gray, 
and if you knew him you would not blame me for hating him, she told me. But you knew what he was like before you married him, I commented. No, I only thought I knew him, she said. I remember that you told me not to marry him. I know that I should have listened to you, but it's too late to say that now. At first, I thought that what he was like wouldn't matter. I thought he would let me do whatever I liked. But he keeps me here like a prisoner and he pays me no attention. He won't let me go to London and have fun with my friends because he says that I flirt with other men and spend too much money. But he does exactly what he wants. He goes to London and leaves me here alone. He gambles and flirts with other women and is almost always drunk. Oh, I would give anything, anything at all not to be married to that horrible man, but to be Miss Murray again. Then she stopped speaking and burst into tears. Of course, I felt very sorry for her. I tried to comfort her and give her some advice. I told her to keep calm and try to be polite to her husband. I suggested that she should try not to think about him and keep herself busy with other things, perhaps reading, and especially her new little daughter. I reminded her that her little baby would grow into a young woman who would truly love her. But what if the child grows up to be just like its father? Cried Rosalie. I don't think that is likely. She is a girl and she looks very much like you, I told her. Even so, I can't put all of my hopes in a child, she said. It is only one step better than focusing your whole life on a dog. And I can't spend my life reading. I am young and I should be having fun. The best way to enjoy yourself, I told her, is to do what is right and hate nobody. The more wise and good you are the more happiness you have. And I have one more piece of advice to offer you don't make an enemy of your mother-in-law. I have never met her, but I have heard good things as well as bad things about her. If you could be kind to her I believe that in time she could become a good friend for you here. But I am afraid that Rosalie did not really listen to any of the advice I had given her. I realized that I could be of little help to her and this made it even more painful for me to see what her life had become. Rosalie begged me to stay longer, but after two more days... I told her that my mother needed me at the school. I was very sorry to say goodbye to Rosalie and leave her in her wonderful, but sad, house. I knew she was very unhappy but I could see no easy way out of the life, which she herself had chosen. Chapter 15 A Walk on the Beach the school that my mother owned in Scarborough was a short distance from the sea. I loved being near the sea and I would sometimes walk along the beach in my free time. I awoke on the third morning after my return from Ashby Park and saw that the sun was shining. Knowing that my mother would still be asleep, I quietly got dressed and left the house to go for an early morning walk. The sea air was fresh and the summer sky was a clear blue. I walked along the long, empty beach and watched the white waves as they came up onto the sand. I felt full of life and as I walked along, I forgot all of my worries. At first, I was alone on the beach, but as the sun rose higher in the sky, I saw that a few people had appeared. There were now several figures ahead of me exercising horses or taking dogs for a walk. As I approached the end of the beach I heard a dog bark behind me, then suddenly a small animal came running round in front of me and stopped right at my feet. 
It was Snap the rough little dog that had been mine at Horton Lodge. I called his name and he jumped up into my arms. I was so pleased to see him and he was clearly excited to see me. But how had he got here? He could not have come so far on his own, so I looked to see who he might be with. I turned around and saw. Mr. Weston. Your dog remembers you well, Miss Gray, he said warmly, you must get up very early. Not often as early as this, I said, still very much surprised to see both Mr. Weston and Snap. I imagine you must live quite close to the beach, then. In what part of the town do you live? He asked. I never managed to find out. Never managed to find out? Had he been looking for me, then? I felt my heart jump in my chest. Then I remembered that he had asked me a question, so I told him where our house was. He asked if the school was doing well. I told him that several more pupils had come to join the school since the new year had started and that we were doing very well. People must have heard that you are a very good teacher, then, he said. No, it is my mother they have heard about, I replied, she works very hard and manages things so well. And she is so active, clever, and kind. I would like to meet your mother. Will you introduce me to her one day if I come to your house? He asked. Yes, of course I will, I told him. And would it be all right if I came to visit you every now and then? Mr. Weston wanted to know. Yes, I don't think my mother would mind, I replied. We turned and started to walk back along the beach together. You haven't asked me why I have come to Scarborough, he said after a few moments silence, surely you can't think that I am rich enough to be here on holiday. Well, I heard that you had left Horton, I said. But you hadn't heard that I am the new vicar of a parish just two miles from here. He asked. No, I said. Dot, I don't receive much news from Horton. Well then, congratulations. I very much hope that you like your new parish and your new job. I think I will like it more in a year or two, he said, when I have made some of the changes there that I think are needed. It is certainly wonderful to have a parish all to myself with nobody to disagree with me and tell me how I should do things differently. Of course, he was talking about Mr. Hatfield. Then he added, and I am lucky enough to have a nice house in a good area and a salary of £300 a year. In fact, I have nothing but loneliness to complain about. And there is nothing I could wish for apart from someone to share all of that with. He looked directly at me as he spoke these last few words and I felt my cheeks go red. I felt embarrassed. Oh, I'm sure that when you are well known in your new parish, I said quickly, there will be many women there who will be keen to share that life with you. I am not so presumptuous as to expect there will be a lot of women who want to marry me, he said, but even if there were so many, I am looking for a very special type of person to share my life with. Perhaps I wouldn't find that person among the ladies of my parish. If you are looking for perfection to find someone who has no faults at all, I told him, then I don't think you will ever find that person. No, I am not looking for perfection, he replied. Dot, I have no right to because I am certainly not perfect myself. We had reached the town now and before we walked up the bank onto the street, he offered me his arm to support me.
I put my arm in his. Once we were in the street the horses, carriages, and men moving around us made it difficult to talk. We walked in silence for a few minutes, arm in arm, before he spoke again. You don't often go down to the beach, do you? He said. I have walked there many times since I have come here. I have come both morning and evening and I have never seen you until now. And I have looked for your school as I have walked about the town, but have never found it. Once or twice I asked if anyone knew of the school, but no one could tell me where the house was. He walked with me to the end of the street where I lived. I'll leave you here, Miss Gray, he said kindly. And when will you come to meet my mother? I asked him. I hope to come tomorrow, he told me. He said goodbye and then called Snap to him. The dog did not know which one of us he should follow. I'm afraid I won't offer to give him back to you said Mr. Weston, smiling, because I like him. Oh, I am happy not to have him, I replied, now that I know he is a very good owner I won't need to worry about him anymore. You believe that I am a very good owner then? He said and smiled again before walking away. I returned home full of happiness. I had been given another chance and I hoped that this time I would be lucky. Chapter 16 The Happy Ending Well, Agnes, you must not take such a long walk again before breakfast, said my mother, are you feeling ill? She had seen that I had drunk an extra cup of coffee but had eaten nothing. I told her that I just did not feel hungry because I was hot and tired after my walk. The truth was that I was too busy thinking about how to tell my mother about Mr. Weston to think of eating. If he was coming to visit the next day, then I had to tell her that I had met him on the beach. I waited until breakfast had been taken away and until I had calmed down a little. Then. Once I had sat down and started to do some drawing, I began. I bumped into an old friend on the beach, Mother, I said. An old friend? She said, who on earth could that be? Two old friends, in fact, I told her, one was a dog, and then I reminded her of Snap, who I had told her about in my letters from Horton Lodge. I now told her how he had suddenly appeared on the beach and had run to me and the other friend, I continued was Mr. Weston, the curate of Horton. Mr. Weston. I've never heard of him before, my mother said, yes, you have, I corrected her, I've mentioned him several times, I think, but you don't remember. I've heard you talk about Mr. Hatfield, she told me. Mr. Hatfield was the vicar and Mr. Weston was the curate. Anyway, he was on the beach this morning with the dog he must have bought it from someone in the village at Horton. We talked for a little while after the dog had found me. He asked about our school and how well it was doing. I told him it was doing very well thanks to your clever management. When I mentioned you, he said that he would like to meet you. Then he asked if I would introduce you to him, if he happened to come by and visit tomorrow. So I said that I would. Was it all right for me to say that? Of course, replied my mother, what type of man is he? He is a very good man, I think, but you will meet him yourself tomorrow, I told her dot he is the new vicar in a village just two miles from here and he has only been in that parish for a few weeks. I imagine that he has not yet made any new friends and would like some company. 
I spent the next morning feeling nervous and excited while I waited for him to come. He finally came at noon. Having introduced him to my mother, I moved away to the other side of the room to carry on with my drawing while they talked. They got on extremely well together. I was so pleased because I had been worried about what my mother would think of him. He did not stay long that time, but when he left, she said she would be happy to see him whenever he found the time to visit us again. After he had left, she said to me, well, I think he is a very sensible man. But why did you sit over there, Agnes? And why didn't you join in with the conversation? I didn't join in because you were having a good conversation and did not seem to need any help from me, I explained, and anyway, he had come to see you, not me. After that, Mr. Weston often came to visit us. As it was the summer holidays and my mother and I were not teaching, he could come at any time during the day. When he came he spoke mostly to my mother, but I did not mind that. She loved to talk and I was happy to sit and listen to the two people I loved most in the world. Formality was quickly forgotten and Mr. Weston began to call me Agnes instead of Miss Gray. The days when he did not visit seemed long and very dull but I always had his next visit to look forward to. One evening, near the end of the summer holidays, he came to the house and asked me to go for a walk with him. He wanted to show me the wonderful view over the sea from a nearby hill. With my mother's permission, I agreed to go and went upstairs to get ready. I took a little longer than usual. When we left the house a few minutes later, I put my arm into his and we went through the busy streets of the town. As we walked quickly, along he said very little and I began to think that something was wrong. But as we came out of the town he slowed down a little and he seemed cheerful again. I'm sorry Agnes, he said, I think that I have been walking too fast for you. I was keen to get out of the town but we can walk as slowly as you wish now. I think there is going to be a wonderful sunset. We walked in silence up the hill for a few minutes before he spoke again. It is still quite lonely in my house, he said and smiled at me, and I have now met all of the ladies in my parish and quite a few in this town, too. But I'm not interested in any of them. In fact, there is only one person in the world that I want to share my life with. And that person is you. Miss Gray. Agnes, will you marry me? Are you serious, Mr. Weston? I asked him, because I could not believe what I had heard. Serious? He cried, how could you think that I would joke about something like this? He put his hand gently over mine as it rested on his arm. He must have felt that I was feeling nervous. I hope that I have not shocked you, he said in a serious way looking at me closely, you must have known that I am not the sort of man to flatter you all the time and talk romantic nonsense. I hope that you would know that a single look or a single word of mine meant more than the many things that most other men use to flirt with women. I said nothing for a moment. Many thoughts were going through my head. So, what is your answer? He asked me. But what about my mother? I said nervously, I'm not sure I could leave her to run the school on her own. You don't need to worry about that, he told me gently, while you were getting ready to come out for this walk I talked to your mother. She said that she would be happy for you to marry me if that's what you wanted to do. I also suggested to her, in case you said yes, that
that she could come and live with us, I thought that you would like that. But she refused and said that she could now afford to employ an assistant to help her teach the pupils. So, you can see that your mother will be fine. Is there anything else that you are worried about? No, I said, no, there isn't. Do you love me then? He asked, holding my hand tightly in his. Yes, I replied, yes, and I will be very happy to marry you. And here I will stop writing. My diary, in which I used to write these chapters, does not continue any further. I will just say that I will never forget that wonderful summer evening. I will always remember how we stood and watched that beautiful sunset together. My heart was filled with so much love and happiness that I could not have imagined being any happier. A few weeks after that, once my mother had found an assistant to help her at the school, I married Edward Weston, and I am so pleased that I did. We have had difficult times and we know that we will have more but we deal with them well together. We try to make the most of life and we enjoy each other's company. Edward has made some surprising changes in his parish. He is a good man and the people there love and respect him. Whatever his faults are as a man, and of course, everybody has their faults, no one could say that he is not a good vicar, husband or father. Our children, Edward, Agnes and little Mary, are doing well. At the moment they are mostly taught by me and I try to give them as much love and care as a mother can. Edward's salary is more than enough for what we need. We try to be careful with the money we have. In this way, we live a comfortable life and manage to save a little which we will give to our children when they leave home. We even have enough left to give something to others who might need it. I am grateful for the life that I have led so far. It is not the life of big houses and expensive parties that other people may have, but I think of myself as being lucky. And now I will end my story, because you can now easily imagine how I might happily spend the years that I have left to live.